as people who have been called out of death, we do not possess rights. We do not possess entitlements. We do not possess opinions. All we possess is the obligation to submit. All we possess is the obligation to obey. I love to open God's Word with you just as well. And you are there open to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at these texts a bit a bit out of order, but purposefully in that way. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19 first. And then we're going to rewind just a little bit and look at Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Before the pandemic ever hit, I announced to you my intentions that we would be walking verse by verse through the pastoral epistles. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, that we would exhaustively look at every verse, every word in those three letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the pastors that he had commissioned to go and to set the church in order. In fact, that's what he tells uh, Timothy, his whole purpose in 1 Timothy was to set the church in order. And then the apostle tells Titus, I'm sending you to Crete to set in order the things that have been left undone. And so from the pastoral epistles, we see God's design for church governance. We see God's design for how the church is to be organized and is to be set up and how it is to function. Now, there are other passages in the New Testament that we're going to isolate and look at, but as I told you, my intention in walking through the pastoral epistles verse by verse is to the end that we would, as a church, affirm a brand new set of bylaws. A brand new set of governing documents. Bylaws are the rules by which our church functions. There is a distinction between our constitution and our bylaws. Our constitution tells people in a formal legal document who we are. And within that legal document telling telling the government and telling others who we are, we also have a statement of faith. We have a confession of faith which is really two parts. We have the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. That's a confessional statement that Southern Baptists affirm in 2000. We hold to the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. You may hear me at times refer to that as the 2000 BFNM. But within our confessional statement, we also affirm the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Now, you have, the, you have our Constitution, which is those portions But then you also have what is called the bylaws. The bylaws are the governing rules of our organization, of our institution. It delineates officers, it delineates responsibilities, qualifications, the rules governing meetings, and so on and so forth. It is a legal and it is a binding document. It is my understanding, looking at that document and also looking at the Word of God, that we can do better. That we can come better into line with the truth of Scripture. And I'll confess to you, that is my only agenda. I've tried to be as transparent as possible that that is my only agenda and that that is the agenda. To simply to make this church be as closely in tune and in line with God's Word as we possibly can be. That is our reasonable act of worship. We call Jesus Lord... Therefore, we ought to submit to the Lord in everything. So we're going to begin now, starting this Sunday, and until we're done, the plan is to have a vote on September the 12th, to vote on a new set of bylaws. This morning will, in fact, be the first meeting that our bylaws team is going to have. And we're going to begin that process of reworking our bylaws in order to present them to the church and have a vote on September the 12th. My endeavor now as your senior pastor is to simply do that, to pastor you through that process. I want want to be crystal clear, translucently transparent, so that you can see exactly what the agenda is. And quite plainly, the agenda is to abide by God's Word. That's it. 
It is to abide by God's word. I am very well uh, under the impression and understanding that my pastorate here is an interim. Just like your membership here is an interim. There will come a time where I will not be the pastor of this church anymore. Whether the Lord moves me on in life or moves me on through death. And so obedience is the only thing that I can give to the Lord. Obedience is the only thing that will be lasting to the Lord. And so that's our offering to Him. That's our gift to Him. This morning, we begin the process of walking through these New Testament texts pertaining to church governance. Pertaining to church governance. It's my intention over these coming weeks to walk through every New Testament text in a theological exposition and show you from God's Word, not from my opinion or anyone else's, but to show you from God's Word, God's design for church governance. God's design for church governance. And what we are going to do to create maximum transparency and opportunity for questions is on Wednesday night, so this Wednesday and every Wednesday after that, to correlate with the Sunday morning sermon, what I will do this Wednesday night is I will review this morning's sermon. And then I will open up for the rest of the time for questions. You have questions, those are the times to answer. Now, I know that, that we will likely pursue having at least maybe one town hall when we complete writing the bylaws, but I'll just be very honest to you. Every Wednesday night between here and there is a town hall. If you want your questions answered, you need to be there. If you don't want your questions answered, don't be there. And if you're not there, it's going to be assumed that you really don't want your questions answered. So let's make sure that we walk through this together and, and avail ourselves of every opportunity to be in unity. And as Brother Peter just said a few moments ago, the way to unity is through submission to the Word of God. So we're looking at God's design for church governance. This morning is part one of a I don't know how many parts sermon. It's part one, and what we're looking at this morning is institution and authority. Institution and authority. There are four foundational truths that I want to point you to that if we can just agree to submit to God's word and abide by these four foundational truths, we'll walk together in unity. But if any one of us bucks any one of these foundational truths, that's where the crack is going to come. That's where the disunity and the factions will begin. Four foundational truths as we begin to walk through God's design for church governance. We're looking at the institution of the church, the institution, the, the building of the church, what the church is. And then we're looking at authority, not the authority of the church, but the authority over the church, the authority over the church. To do this, we're going to look at two, two particular texts, and I'm just going to confess to you my intention here is not to do what I normally do on Sunday morning, which is to take a passage of Scripture and walk you verse by verse through the text. That's not my intention this morning. That would be a single text exposition if you want to get technical about it. My intention is not to do a single text exposition, but to rather do a theological exposition. I want to show you a couple of theological principles that come out of these passages. Three out of the first passage and one out of the second passage. And putting those together, we can begin to systematize and understand God's system for church governance. So again, it's not my intention to fully expose either one of these texts of Scripture. In time, Lord willing, we will do that, but that's not the endeavor for this morning. We're really going to camp out on just one verse in the first text and a few verses in the second text. And we're going to spend all of our time just right there. So please follow along closely, put your cleats on spiritually, and dig in with me. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. God's design for church governance. Let's look at the institution of the church. In verse 13... It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, this is a place of pagan worship, a place of idolatry. 
In Caesarea Philippi, when you go to the land of Israel and you go to this place where it's very likely that the apostle Peter made his good confession of Christ, you see that it was a place of idolatry. In fact, there's a temple to Pan. There is a, there is a um, cemetery there to goat demons. This is a place where people would go and they would worship false gods. It's a pantheon of gods there. And so they come to Caesarea Philippi And Jesus, it says in verse 13, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? In other words, who are the crowds, who are the crowds saying that I am? Is what Jesus is asking. Verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist. So some say that you are John, the one who would precede you. Some say you're John the Baptist, even though he's been put to death. Some people say John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's you, Jesus. Some some people say that. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, that great Old Testament prophet. Some people say that you're Elijah, the one that the later prophets said would come. Some people say that you're just a prophet. Some say you're a preacher, John the Baptist. Some say you're a prophet, Elijah. And others say Jeremiah, another prophet, or one of the other prophets. Verse 15, he, that is Jesus, said to them, but who do you say that I am? And that's the operative question, isn't it, Brother Eric? Oh, it's not so much about what other people say about Jesus. Brother Eric pointed out a number of weeks ago, what you believe about Jesus is actually the most important thing about you. Who do you say that Jesus is? This is a room largely full of people that confess that Jesus is the Son of God. A room largely full of people that confess that Jesus was sent here, the Son of God sent to the earth to live a sinless life and then to die a death he didn't deserve, which he was dying on sinners' behalf. And then God raised his son up from the dead, affirming his righteousness and promising that anyone who puts their faith in Jesus would have their sins forgiven and have the goodness and the righteousness of Christ given to them as a gift. There are many people who that is what they believe about Jesus. You may be a person that does not believe that about Jesus this morning, and I'm praying for you right now that you would have your heart opened up and you would believe in the Lord as Jesus Christ. But who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, meaning you are the anointed one. You are the chosen one of God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 17, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or Simon son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And friend, that's what I'm praying for you. I'm praying that this morning that God the Father would reveal to you who Jesus is. That God the Father would reveal to you that Jesus is the anointed one of God. He is the Son of God, and He is the Lord of your life. Jesus says, Peter, this is why you understand It wasn't your intellect or your heart. It wasn't your best thought that revealed to you that I am the Son of God, Jesus says. It's the Father. It's by His grace. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so what has Peter just confessed? He has just confessed the bedrock. He has confessed the foundation of the church. The church is made up of people who make that confession that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. Look at Jesus' response, verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter, you're rock. And on this rock that is on your confession, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you The keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter makes this good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're blessed, Peter. 
for understanding this. My Father revealed this, this confession, this truth to you. And on this truth, on this confession, what does Jesus say that he will do? He says, I will build my church. I will build my church. There are three foundational truths that I want to point out to you out of those three phrases, two words and one phrase. I will build my church. Foundational truth number one, if you will write this down with me, Jesus is the founder and architect of the church. Jesus is the founder and the architect of the church. This is Jesus' design. Jesus drew up the blueprints of the church. Jesus founded it. Jesus brought about its inception. Jesus is the founder and the architect of this church. We may look at earthly people and say, oh, back in 1950 when this church began, Brother Wallace began this as a mission sent over from First Baptist. And we can begin to look at at how that history unfolds and how Hillcrest Baptist Church saw its foundation come to fruition. But the foundation of the church was laid far before 1950. The foundation of the church is in this confession that the Apostle Peter made in Caesarea Philippi. And that confession was given to Peter as a gift from the Father as a gift from the Father in accordance with the church being a gift to the Son. And so Jesus says, I will build. Jesus is the founder of the church. The local church is simply a manifestation of Jesus founding the church at large. So we need to establish that truth, that even as the founder of the church, he is the architect It is Jesus' sole right to build the church as he sees fit. Bylaws is essentially blueprints. The bylaws of a church are essentially its blueprints. The structure of the church, the walls, the inner workings, the layout how everything functions and coordinates together, and who has the right to dictate those blueprints. Easy enough. Jesus says, I will build. He uses the same word, oiki domeo. He uses the same word in Matthew chapter 7. And I want to look very closely at this word. I'm actually going to read verse 24 through 27. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Listen to what Jesus says about building. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So if you hear the words of Jesus and you do the words of Jesus, you are likened to a wise man. A wise man who builds on the right foundation. He builds on a sturdy, steady foundation. And what is the foundation that you're building upon? You're building upon the words of Jesus. He will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 25 of Matthew 7. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. If a local church is to survive and is to be steady and firmly founded, It's got to be built on the rock of the Word of God. If you build a local church 
on anything but the rock of the Word of God, that local church, just give it time, will not stand the test of opposition and the weathers of the world. You just give it time. In fact, I would say that a church that is not built on the Word of God will crumble under its own weight. Won't even come. The opposition from the outside won't be what makes it crumble. It'll be the poor infrastructure within that is the cause of its demise. Jesus is the founder and the architect of the church. Before I go any further, I want to go ahead and summarize the entirety of everything that I'm going to say to you this morning. And I want you to grasp this truth now that we have a portion of it in our heart. I want you to meditate on this truth and let this be the foundation that we build upon. Jesus Christ is Lord of His church, ruling and instructing her by His authoritative Word. Jesus Christ is Lord of, not the church, He is Lord of His church, ruling and instructing by His authoritative Word. So Jesus says, I will build. In other words, He's the founder and He's the architect of the church. Foundational truth number two, write this down with me. Jesus is Lord over the church as she is purchased by his precious blood. Jesus is Lord over the church as she is purchased by his precious blood. Jesus not only says, I will build, but he uses that personal pronoun formed off that word ego. He says, I will build my, or mu. I will build my church, my possession. I will build my house. You see, if you were building a house, I doubt very seriously, Brother Eric, when y'all were building your house, you and Miss Allison, that you invited other people to your house that you were currently living in and said, hey, will y'all give us your architectural designs and just tell us how to build it? What'd you say? You said, no, I'm spending the money on this, right? I'm spending the money on this. I'm going to design this house exactly the way my wife and I want this house to be designed. I'll tell you, Jesus is the only one that's paid a price for the institution of the church. Jesus is the only one who's laid down assets in order to purchase a people for himself. He says, I will build my. I will build my. And what did Jesus give in order to pay for the building of his church? Listen to these passages of Scripture. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Apostle Paul speaking to the elders of Ephesus as he's departing, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood, which he obtained with his own blood, the only person who has skin in the game when it comes to the church, is Jesus. The only one who has skin in the game when it comes to the church is Jesus. He purchased the church. He says, I will build my church. Now, I say this from time to time, and I I don't mean it in the way that I'm about to blast. There are times that I say, Hillcrest is my church. Now, I I never mean that I own this church. I mean that my membership is given to this church. Hillcrest is a church that I and my family are so graciously a part of, so blessed to be a part of. I'm proud of this church. I'm proud to be a part of this church. And that's why why I call it my church. And I, I have a bit of ownership in serving here, but this is not my possession. Jesus says, I will build my Church, he is the only one who can rightfully use that possessive pronoun in talking about the church. This church does not belong to our forefathers. This church does not belong to any active members or any future members. This church belongs to Jesus. Again, he's the only one with the skin in the game. 
literally the only one who's paid blood for the institution of the church, which he obtained with his own blood, the apostle says in Acts 20. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, he says, knowing that you were ransomed, that means you were purchased, you, the people of God, the church of God, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. What a weighty thought. That we, we are a part of, of the building of the church that Christ purchased by his own shed blood. That he bought us with something far more costly than money, than silver or gold, which loses its value. He bought us with that which will never lose its value or power, with his precious blood. Think this is important in Scripture? You better believe it. It'll be important all throughout eternity. I want you to listen to the song that is being sung in glory right now and that will be sung when you arrive in glory. Listen to this. Revelation 5, verse 9 through 10. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain. This is what makes you worthy. For you were slain, and your blood, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. It is a fearful and it is a highly privileged reality that you and I are a part of the blood bought people of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 20. He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, that is, that he might hold first place. For in him the fullness of God, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Not only does Jesus say of the church, my church, Jesus says of all things and beings, mine. There is no molecule in existence over which Jesus does not declare that possessive pronoun, my. We've got to be very careful. In fact, I'll just say we probably ought to avoid it altogether, ever acting as though we possess the church. We're part of the body, but we don't possess the body. We're part of this church, but we don't own it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 through 23. It says, And he, that is God the Father, put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I realize that I'm belaboring the point, but I want to establish it from the Word of God that Jesus is Lord over the church. He is Lord over the church as she was purchased by His precious blood. As Lord, Jesus is the only one who has a right to an opinion. No one, 
Not myself, not any other pastor who's preceded me, nor will come after me, nor any deacon who has ever been here or who will come or who is in the present, or any church member is entitled, is entitled to an opinion. The church is ruled over by one sovereign, by the Lord Jesus himself. Foundational truth number three. Jesus formed his church. Listen to where Jesus got the materials to build it. Jesus formed his church by calling people out of death and into his assembly. That's the raw materials. Jesus formed his church by calling people out of death. Well, who's that? Well, that's us. He called people out of death and formed them into his assembly. Jesus says, I will build my church. That word for church is the Greek word ekklesia. It is built on the Greek word which means call out or call forth. So what is this church that Jesus says is his sole possession that he is both founder and architect of? What is the church? The church is people whom God has called out of the world, who he's called out of death, out of being children who were by na- or people who were by nature children of wrath, calling us out of that and into his assembly. As people who have been called out of death, We do not possess rights. We do not possess entitlements. We do not possess opinions. All we possess is the obligation to submit. All we possess is the obligation to obey. Jesus formed his church by calling people out of death and into his assembly. The Hebrew translation of this word, ekklesia, it's translated in the Old Testament as kahal. That's the way the Septuagint translators rendered it. It means assembly. Anytime the people of Israel would kahal, when they would gather together, when they would come together and the elders of Israel would rule over the people of Israel, that is where we get our term, ekklesia. Jesus says, I am forming a new assembly. I'm forming a new gathering of people. And that new gathering of people is people not purchased out of Egypt physically. It is people purchased out of bondage spiritually. Those people purchased out of slavery to sin and death are purchased unto Christ while he says, my, and they are his people. They are his formed and fashioned assembly. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called. That's the verbal form of ecclesia. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. So you are part of this body. Why? Because Christ called you out. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Why are you a member of this church? Why are you a member of this church? Jesus called you to be a member of this church. Jesus issued that invitation, that authoritative call, and you said, yes, Lord, because he gave you the ability to say, yes, Lord. No one in here is a member of this church by right. No one in here is a member of this church by length of tenure. No one in, is here in this church as a member because they inherited that membership. You are a member here only, and I am a member here only because Christ called us to be members here. What a privilege. What a privilege to be here and not here. What a privilege to be part of this special church family, this blood-bought people of Christ. Jesus formed his church by calling people out of death 
and into his assembly. Colossians chapter 1, 13 through 14. Let's drive this point deep into our heart. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I want to make a note here that Jesus as Lord provides the only authoritative blueprints for the construction of the church. Jesus, as Lord of the church, provides the only authoritative blueprints for the construction of the church. So then let's look at those blueprints. Let's look at the authority. We understand the institution. Jesus says, I will build my church. These called out people from death They're mine, and I'm forming them, and I'm fashioning them into the body that I want them to be. And they will be my body in this world. They will be my representative in this world. And I'll organize them, and I'll set them as I so see fit. So let's look at the authority of the church. We know the institution. Now look at the authority. Go to Matthew chapter 15 with me, verse 1 through 9. Matthew 15, verse 1 through 9. Let's see the fourth of these four foundational truths. I'll announce it to you on the outset here. Foundational truth number four, Jesus has given his word as the sole authority over his church. Jesus has given his word as the sole authority over his church. You have heard me say it many many times like this. The Bible is our sole authority of faith and practice. That is exactly what I mean. Jesus has given his word as the sole authority over his church. Now, there are at least three things that people sometimes use in order to say, well, this is authoritative. And we're going to dismantle those three things that people normally appeal to and establish the fact that Jesus' word is the sole authority over the church. Looking at Matthew chapter 15, you're going to see that the scribes and the Pharisees, they had a particular, a particular example of the way in which they were disregarding the lordship of God, the, the lordship of his word, in order to do what they wanted to do. They were disregarding the word of God in order to honor their traditions. Look at the particular way that they did this and understand that this is a particular example of a very general principle. There are many people that disregard the word of God because they'd rather obey their traditions. Because they'd rather do things the way that they've always been done. And this is the paramount preeminent text that shows us that that ought not be so. In fact, that must not be so. Look at what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Then the Pharisees and scribes, these religious people, the teachers, came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition, the paradosis? Why do they break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Now, a moment of of explanation of what tradition was. The Pharisees and the scribes held that after Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the law, that after Moses wrote the law, they believed that Moses then gave an oral interpretation of what it meant. And they believed that this oral interpretation was handed down generation to generation, even unto them in an unbroken line. So that the things that they remembered their daddy saying were ultimately authoritative. In fact, the Pharisees and the scribes, they cherished and viewed as authoritative the traditions over the word of God. So they say things like this, well, I know that's what Moses said in the Word, but we know what Moses said later on. I know that's what's written on the text, but I know that's what the Bible says, but I've heard it different, but we've done it different, but our teachers taught us different. 
And so they would take the the tradition and then they would impose it as though tradition was law. And so Jesus and his disciples, they didn't go to the lavatory and wash their hands before they eat. And the Pharisees and scribes looked and said, why are you violating the law by not washing your hands before you eat? Well, what law? They're not talking about law. They're talking about the way they always did it. They're talking about tradition. Jesus, why don't you and your disciples do what we've always done? That's what they were asking. He, verse 3, answered them, And why do you break, not the paradosis, why do you break the entole? Why do you break the law, the commandment? Of God. You have your oral tradition, the things that you've heard said and the things that you've always done, but why do you break the written word of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, particular example Jesus gives, for God gave the command, He commanded, honor your father and mother. And whoever reviles or curses his father or mother must surely die. This is what the law of Moses said. Honor your father and mother. That doesn't mean just to obey them. It also means, particularly here, to take care of them financially in their old age. Honor would be the Greek translation timao. It's the same word that's used in 1 Timothy 6 about honoring widows. It's the same word that's used in 1 Timothy 5 to talk about giving honorarium as payment to pastors. So honor your father and mother. That's what Moses said. Care for them financially in their old age. And whoever curses their father or mother must surely die. That's what the law says. But should there ever be an adversative particle after the law of God? This is what God's Word says. But. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father says, this this is what you have done. You, You hear the word of God written down, honor your father and mother, but when it comes time to take care of your parents in their old age, what you say is, hey, mom, dad, the money that would have gone to help you out in your old age, guess what? I'm putting it in the offering plate. You don't get it. Why? Because that's what, that's, what, that's what we believe is our, that's what our tradition is. That's what we've always done, mom and dad. Sorry, mom, dad, that's just what we've always done. And guess what? Their mom and dad probably did that to their parents too. Sorry. We get to break the command of God because we've just always done it that way. And so did mom, and so did dad, and so did grandma and grandpa. Verse 6, Jesus says, so... For the sake of your tradition, you have made void. You have made empty. You have akurao. You have, you have withdrawn the lordship out of the command. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void. You don't surrender to the lordship of the word of God. Because that's the way you've always done it. What does he say in verse 7? He says, you hypocrites, you pretenders, you two-faced people, you pretenders. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain, fruitlessly, do they worship me. And this is why their songs are fruitless and why their lives are worthless. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He says their entire life toward God is fruitless and worthless because they believe their traditions are their authority. Because they do not submit themselves to the law of God. One thing that I do not want our time to be here on earth is vain. I don't want this church's existence under my pastorate to be in vain to be fruitless. In many and sundry ways through the past seven years, we have together submitted to the law of God. We have submitted to the Word of God, and there has been fruit from that, great fruit, work of God. 
Now comes another opportunity to either submit to the law of God and bear great fruit or to reject the law of God, which is always a vain and futile pursuit. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Now I'm going to tell you, I'll make it very clear right now, that there are certain aspects, not all, but there are certain aspects of our current bylaws that are not founded in Scripture. There, there's, no, there's no biblical substantiation for it. For the way we do some things. Not all things, but some things. I want to talk about three facts real quick. Three facts that I want us to agree on as we move forward. Because when we, when we begin addressing these bylaws and we say, what we've done for a long time, that tradition is exactly that. It's a tradition but it's not the biblical manner of doing things. When we say that, when we acknowledge that, there's going to be an opportunity for negative response. But I want you to question what that negative response is based upon. Three facts about these negative responses. Fact number one, tradition is not superior in any way to the Word of God. Tradition is not superior in any way to the Word of God. It is not acceptable for reasoning to begin. That's the way we've always done it. Precedent is not king. Jesus is king. The Word of God is king. Tradition is not superior in any way to the Word of God. Fact number two, experience is is not permission to disregard the Word of God. Experience is not permission to disregard the Word of God. There may be some kinds of statements like this. Well, in a previous church, this is what we went through. Oh, and what you're talking about didn't work there. In a previous church, this is what happened. I'm sorry. But experience is not permission to disregard the clearly revealed Word of God. Or to say, well, I went through this one time, or we tried it that way one time. No. Experience is not permission to disregard the Word of God. Or else you could go back to Matthew 15, 1 through 9, and maybe Jesus would have said something like this. You disregard the Word of God for your experience. Maybe sometimes when we obey the Word of God, difficult times come. But that doesn't mean that we disregard the call to obedience. It means that we suffer as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus, as the Apostle Paul commanded Timothy. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, Father. Experience is not permission to disregard the Word of God. Tradition is not superior in any way to the Word of God. Fact number three, dig in here. Ignorance is not an excuse to avoid conforming to the Word of God. Ignorance is not an excuse to avoid conforming to the Word of God. There may be the excuse that comes up, well, I never heard that before. You've heard it now. And I'm not so much concerned about I've never heard that before. I would be concerned as why have you not read that before? I didn't write this. This has been around a lot longer than I have. The question is, why haven't you been reading your Bible? Why have you not read the scriptures that tell us exactly how the church is to be organized? The blueprints have been here. It's, it's been rolled up in, in, in between two pieces of leather. Ignorance is not an excuse to avoid conforming with the Word of God. Well, I've never heard that before, so I'm just not, it's not valid. It's not valid. These three facts, I'm telling you, I'm going to appeal to them in the process. On Wednesday nights, when we begin to have questions this Wednesday night, if tradition is brought up, experience is brought up, or ignorance is brought up, these facts are going to be read. The only thing that is 
authoritative over the church is the Word of God. I'm going to read you a quote from John MacArthur in his book, The Master's Plan for the Church. He says, One of the worst possible assaults on God's Word comes from people who say they believe the Bible yet do not know what it teaches. One of the worst assaults on the Word of God comes from people who say they believe the Bible yet do not know what it teaches. I'm going to make a note here that the church is ruled and organized sovereignly by the Word of God. Any deviation, any deviation from God's design for the church always results in chaos and corruption. Any deviation from God's good design for the church results in chaos and corruption. Let me read you a quote from a man named Alfred Kine in a book, I Will Build My Church. Listen to this carefully. He says, Each time that man has believed himself to be more intelligent than God, that he has painstakingly developed a religious system better adapted to the psychology of man, more comfortable to the spirit of our times, instead of simply following the Neo-Testamentary, that is the New Testament model, his attempt has been short-lived because of failure due to some unforeseen difficulty. All heresies and deviations in the church spring from abandonment of the Scripture and of the model for the church which they present. All heresies and deviations in the church spring from abandonment of the Scripture and of the model for the church which they present present. Let me tell you, friends, as we walk through these texts of Scripture and we say we need to come in line with the Word of God, I want you to understand our conforming to the Word of God is our act of loving worship to Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keep them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And I'll tell you this, if we will abide by the word of God and we will conform to the word of God, you will have a joy more full than ever would have been possible otherwise. John chapter 15, 10 through 11. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Why did God give us his design for church governance? Well, friends, it's the same reason he gave us his design for the home. It's the same reason that he gave us his design for our daily lives as individuals in this world. So that our joy may be in him and that his joy in us may be full. It's so that we would have that loving communion and fellowship with him. Oh, please don't think that submitting to God's word is going to rob us of anything. All it's going to do is enrich our fellowship. It is going to enrich our love for God. It is going to demonstrate our love to our Lord, and it will cause fullness of joy in this church family. I believe wonderful things about this church family. I am extremely excited about walking through this and us uniting together as one moving together with one Lord and one faith as one church and saying yes with one voice. But you know what that's going to take? That's going to take understanding and holding to these foundational truths that Jesus Christ is Lord of his church, ruling and instructing her by his authoritative word. Would you pray with me?